Welcome. Welcome to uh, Earth Science. Uh, this uh, lecture is the introduction lecture to Earth Science. And if you uh, look at the uh, first slide on the screen, it kind of uh, outlines really what the course is going to entail um, throughout the semester. Uh, we look down here and we have a uh, concept of meteorology, where again, we'll look at uh, different processes that take place within the atmosphere. We'll spend a lot of our time in the geological uh, concepts, uh, looking at rocks and minerals, plate tectonics, earthquakes. Uh, we'll look at uh, the role of water and how it uh, the processes that take place on Earth. And then down here, uh, we'll look at a little oceanography uh, throughout the semester. But again, uh, in terms of the oceanography, we'll be looking at the physical aspects of the ocean floor. And uh, this is where we'll take a, uh, a a detailed uh, look on the plate tectonics and the processes of moving continents. And then towards the end of the uh, semester, um, we'll take a look at, uh, we'll spend some time with some uh, um, astronomy, astronomical concepts. This particular um, uh, slide presentation really is just an introduction to Earth sciences, and it's just an overall view or overall picture of, um, uh, again, what we're going to look at for the next uh, um, several weeks in this class. Um, also, it entails um, how Earth science is studied and how scientists uh, look at the Earth and how scientists analyze the Earth and the different kinds of uh, thoughts uh, that, that outline uh, the study of, of Earth science. And that's what, kind of what we're headed for in this, in this chapter, just kind of an overview of Earth science. So let's go through and let's look at um, um, the different disciplines within earth science. And really what we want to do here is get down some really good concrete definitions of what each aspect of earth science entails. So we're going to start with um, geology and the geological sciences. And when we look at geology, uh, most of the folks have probably learned that geology is basically the study of the earth. And that's true and that's nice, but what we're going to do in this class is we're going to expand on that defi definition a little bit. And we're going to divide the geolog geology and the geological science into two major parts. And the first part would be physical geology. And physical geology uh, encompasses the materials that comprise the earth, meaning that uh, materials that comprise the earth would uh, look at the rocks, the minerals, the Earth's interior, and so these are physical aspects of the Earth. Also, physically, in geology, it looks at the processes that act below and above the surface. For example, maybe we will look at a chapter in uh, volcanism, volcanoes, in which these are processes that act below the Earth, and certainly we'll spend some time uh, looking at uh, weathering processes which typically take place above the surface of the earth. And really what makes up a typical um, geology bachelor's degree is the foundation of understanding rocks and minerals in terms of um, identifying rocks, where they come from, um, what the rocks tell the scientists in terms of the history of the earth. And certainly we're gonna learn that minerals make up rocks. 
uh, which involves um, a, an element or a component of chemistry. So again, when we look at physical geology, we're looking at the materials that comprise the earth, rocks, minerals, and processes uh, acting below and above the surface. The other aspect of the geological science would be historical geology. And historical geology attempts to understand the origin and the development of the earth. And scientists like to uh, look at the earth uh, in some type of chronological order, uh, looking at the events that have taken over uh, the last 4.6 billion years. The modern belief with respect to the age of our earth today is about 4.6 billion year old earth. And uh, this is um, um, looked at and defined by this uh, type of scale we call the geologic time scale. And so during the semester, we're going to look at uh, geologic dating and geologic time. And so we'll, um, uh, we'll develop and look at what this geologic time scale uh, means and, and how Earth history is uh, put into the geologic time scale. In fact, one of the questions I always like to ask the classes is how many have heard of this uh, movie called Jurassic Park? And most students will say, oh, yes, I've heard Jurassic Park. I watched Jurassic Park. Well, the term Jurassic is a geologic uh, era. Um, I'm sorry, geologic period within the uh, geologic time scale, uh, which marks the uh, dominance of reptiles, or in this case, dinosaurs. And so that's where Steven Spielberg, you know, got the name for his, uh, for his movie is Jurassic Park. So even Steven Spielberg understands the concept of the geologic time scale. Uh, we'll look at um, how geologists or scientists um, date various geologic events. Um, there's two types of types of dating called relative geologic dating and absolute geologic dating. And so both of those types of dating um, events or both those types of dating processes uh, co collaborate really well with the, with the geologic time scale. And then we'll look at the significance of fossils when we look at geologic time uh, in this class. And we find that the significance of fossils um, allows scientists and geologists to date rocks and date geologic events over a wide geographical uh, area. So again, when you look at the study of geology, yes, it is the study of the earth, but geology also encompasses physical geology and historical geology. So for exam purposes, you should be able to do that. When someone says, what is geology? Uh, you should be able to explain uh, physical and historical geology. And again, uh, if one were to pursue a geological degree, uh, you would be you would emphasize most of your um, degree in the physical geology um, area, especially the bachelor's degree, and also the historical geology aspects as well. So let's look at physical oceanography. And again, as I mentioned earlier, physical oceanography in this class is basically looking at uh, the characteristics of the sea floor and looking at um, uh, the, studying the ocean floor. So this is not a biology class. So we're not gonna look at life in the ocean, but instead we're gonna look at the, again, the features of the ocean floor. And one of those areas we're gonna again uh, study pretty extensively is plate tectonics. And plate tectonics, of course, uh, most students have had uh, some kind of introduction to plate tectonics sometime in their scientific um, um, studies um, over the years. And plate tectonics, of course, describes uh, moving continents. And so again, we're gonna spend some time uh, looking at moving continents. And this little picture here um, is a picture just showing that uh, what the continents looked like about 150 to 200 million years ago. And most of you probably have heard the term Pangea. And so this is showing where the continents are all put together um, at one point in Earth history, uh, showing the supercontinent Pangea. We'll also be looking at what we call seafloor topography, uh, which goes hand in hand with plate tectonics because topography describes the lay of the land. And we're gonna find out that on the ocean floor, um, it's a lot more mountainous um, than a lot of the areas that are in the continents. And so there's a lot of steep and gentle topography that outlines the ocean floor. We're also gonna find that there's actually more earthquake and more volcanic activity on the ocean floor than anywhere on the continents. And so it was believed 
back in the uh, mid 1920s that the ocean floor was very dormant at, uh, at some point. And now today, uh, scientists understand that in fact, it's very, very active. So as we uh, explore plate tectonics, uh, we will um, explore the processes uh, that take place on the ocean floor, uh, allowing the continents to, uh, to move. The next area of um, uh, earth science that we'll look at throughout the semester is uh, meteorology. And of course, this encompasses the study of the atmosphere and the processes uh, that, uh, that produce within the atmosphere, the process of produce climate and weather. And although I'm a geologist and that's where my main study is and my main degrees and so forth, I really like meteorology. Um, it's amazing that the uh, thickness of our atmosphere is about only about 60 miles. And yet our atmosphere, the processes within the atmosphere allows our planet uh, to uh, stay cool and warm and allow life as we know it uh, to exist. And so some of the um, uh, areas that we're going to talk about in meteorology is we're going to look at clouds and we're going to look at a process known as adiabatic processes and adiabatic processes um, uh, are processes with an atmosphere that produce uh, clouds. And so no longer uh, after this course, uh, when you look at a cloud, you would think it was a cotton ball, but in fact, you will have a really good uh, scientific uh, process behind that outlines uh, what produces clouds. We'll take a look at the greenhouse effect, uh, which is a process within the atmosphere. Um, I can say that if it wasn't for the greenhouse effect, if that did not take place within our Earth's atmosphere, the average global temperatures on Earth would be minus 15 degrees. And uh, certainly we do not experience average temperatures of minus 15 degrees. So we can certainly um, uh, thank the greenhouse effect for that. So again, we'll take a look at that process throughout the semester. And then probably what's probably the most important um, component or variable uh, within our atmosphere is the role of water vapor. And we're gonna find out that uh, water vapor exists uh, throughout the atmosphere at various percentages. And that uh, role of water vapor gives us the effects of weather, gives us the effects of climate, gives us the effects that we feel um, in our atmosphere. So we'll spend some time uh, looking at the role of water vapor. Then we'll take the last part of the semester and we'll look at astronomy, uh, which in this case represents the study of the universe. But our approach to astronomy and earth science is a very um, um, elementary type approach. We're not gonna do any of the physics or math that is involved in the astronomical concepts, but instead we're gonna just look at the Earth's place in our universe. And we're gonna find out that the Earth um, exists as a, uh, a very small celestial object. And so we'll look at that. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the origin of the Earth, how our Earth became, and then again, how the Earth is related to all other objects in the universe. And uh, we'll take a tour of the solar system in, in this semester, and we will look at uh, the, the different uh, uh, characteristics that outline and define each one of the planets in our solar system. And uh, we can you know, compare that with Earth as well. Also, uh, we'll take a little bit of a look uh, beyond the uh, solar system. And so we'll look at uh, different types of stars, red giants, uh, white dwarfs, and we'll look at the evolution of stars, uh, meaning that a star is born and a star dies and it goes through a different uh, aging process uh, that we'll look at with respect to beyond the solar system. So then really the class over the next semester, over this semester, again, encompasses probably a majority of geological concepts. And then we'll look at meteorological concepts. And then again, we'll end up at the end of the semester looking at the astronomical concepts. So what I like to do typically uh, when we are in a face-to-face -face, uh, situation uh, during the uh, semester is I like to um, uh, uh, poll uh, or interview the class and ask what questions do you have about your earth. And so well, we can't do that on, online at this point. So let's go over some of the questions to consider uh, in terms of what we'll cover uh, during um, um, 
this earth science class. For example, I get questions throughout the semester. Uh, this very first one up here, if you look at your PowerPoints and it says when and if is the big one, meaning the earthquake gonna hit California. Well, we're gonna spend a lot of time in this class uh, talking about earthquakes. We're gonna look at the mechanics of an earthquake. We're gonna look at uh, the types of vibrations or seismic waves that are released during an earthquake. We're gonna look at how earthquakes are measured uh, using the um, Richter scale and the Mercalli scale. And, uh, and we're gonna look at how earthquakes are uh, predicted. Um, in terms of looking at the big one for California, I can tell you at this point, there's many reports by seismologists and earthquake scientists saying that we are headed for a 90% chance of a major earthquake along the San Andreas Fault. And so as we, uh, especially in the area that we live in, in, in Bakersfield, so as we uh, get to the earthquakes, we'll explore that concept a little bit more and we'll look at where that 90% is coming from and some of the evidence uh, that is suggesting that. Uh, another question I get is where do mountains come from? What forces produce mountains? And again, we can answer that uh, by looking at the concept of plate tectonics. And so we'll look at how the continents uh, move around on the Earth's surface and how they enter out each of the continents and land masses interact with one another. And at the interaction um, or boundaries of continents where they're interacting, it produces different kinds of uh, land features. And so we'll cover that through plate tectonics. Why is climate so variable? Well, again, we'll uh, take a look at that in terms of meteorological concepts. You know, why is it uh, basically in Bakersfield where we live, it's basically uh, cold in the winter and hot in the summer. We really don't get very much in between there. And, uh, you know, that's going to deal with uh, the uh, interaction of, of heat between land masses and big water bodies, because one has to realize, you know, the earth is 70% oceans or water versus 30% uh, land masses. And that interaction between how the land and water heat um, gives us our climatic and weather effects. How old is the Earth? Well, again, the modern geological belief uh, based on uh, uh, lots of evidence is the Earth is uh, around 4.6 billion uh, years old. But then on the other hand, there's uh, areas of society that believe the Earth is only 6,000 years old. And so when we get to uh, geologic time, what kind of contrast the difference between a 6,000 year old young earth versus a 4.6 billion year old earth. But again, uh, the modern belief and what this class is based on is an older earth and a 4.6 billion year old earth. Uh, I get this question a lot and that is, is there really global warming? And the answer is, yeah, the atmosphere is warming. Uh, but the real question is, is what's causing the warming? Is humans causing the warming or is it just a natural process that takes place and causes the earth to warm? And so when we get into um, the meteorological aspects of the class, uh, we'll look a little bit at um, the concept of global warming and, and the views in which, uh, you know, who's causing it and what's causing it and so forth. Uh, we'll uh, uh, take a look at um, uh, water and the role of water on earth and that uh, coincides with this question, how do we get water out of the ground? Uh, most of our fresh water and most of our drinking water, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, comes from groundwater resources. And we're going to find that groundwater resources represent a very, very small, small percentage of, uh, of available fresh water uh, for humans. And so we'll talk a little bit about what groundwater is, uh, how you get it out of the earth, and we'll talk about surface waters and what the role of water is. And then finally, um, again, as I mentioned before with astronomy, uh, how does Earth fit in our universe? And so again, we'll take a look at some of the characteristics of our solar system and some of the characteristics beyond the solar system. And so that's really um, what Earth science entails, is three broad categories of geology, meteorology, and um, astronomy. So this picture um, is um, of the Earth. It's a very famous picture. And it's a picture you know, from Earth from, from space. 
And you can kind of see that actually Earth is a very beautiful planet. Certainly you can see the cloud swirls, you can see the landmass. Uh, this looks like the African continent here. And in fact, when uh, scientists first um, uh, viewed uh, the Earth um, uh, from a, a different perspective or from outer space, um, they looked at Earth and, you know, really coined it as what we call the blue marble. So one of the things that we need to look at is, um, is, is, uh, is the question is, how do you think um, these questions are answered with accuracy? For example, folks, you're going to be uh, reading your, your um, Earth science book. You're going to be hearing me talking about various processes uh, that take place um, um, in Earth. And, and you should be asking yourself the question, how do these answers or how do these questions uh, get answered with accuracy? In other words, are, are they accurate? And so we're going to explore a concept that most students are probably familiar with, and this is known as the scientific method. And the scientific method represents a series of steps uh, that lead one to looking at the truth, if you will, or the accuracy of what that process or how that process takes place. And an example that I can think of is, you know, back in the uh, day of uh, Aristotle, which is a, a Greek philosopher, uh, during those times, um, they would ask the Greek philosopher Aristotle, you know, what causes earthquakes? And it was believed back during his time that an earthquake was caused by uh, wind or air uh, that moves through canyons. And as that air be is restricted moving through the canyon, it creates pressure and it allows the land masses to move. And if you think about it, back in Aristotle's day, that was probably a pretty good plausible uh, answer. But today we know that earthquakes are not caused by that. So the question is, how did we um, come to the fact that we know how earthquakes are caused today? And again, that's uh, through the use and through the uh, scientific method. So we're going to kind of take a look at that. So what I would like you to do, what I would like you to do is take a, a piece of paper and I would like you to write a few sentences describing a situation you have been in uh, where uh, where you failed, where you uh, failed, uh, but you tried it and then you failed maybe again, but you tried it again and you failed, but at some point uh, you finally succeeded. So you write down these few sentences and think again, think of a situation you've been in. Because what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you that in fact you probably use, <clears throat> pardon me, you've probably used the scientific method in your in your life almost every day. You just don't know it. And that again, that is where you try something, you fail, you try again, you fail, but you finally figure out um, how it works. So we're going to go through the scientific method in the next few slides. And as we look at the scientific method, I want you to go back to what you wrote down and see if you can fit in the, what we call the logical steps of the scientific method. So how do we find accuracy in the answers? Again, in the answers that you're gonna be uh, looking at and reading through your, uh, through your um, earth science book. And again, hearing me talk about different processes. So again, this is all based on the scientific method inquiry. And what the scientific method represents is what I like to say, a set of logical steps that scientists use to get to what I like to say, the truth of the process that's acting in the universe. And really these logical steps offer you a process of elimination. And as you uh, eliminate various um, um, thoughts, you get closer and closer to the truth. So in really to um, start the scientific method, uh, probably the first step that one takes is what we say, making observations and make and measurements, for example. And so what's an observation? You look at something and you say, hmm, why is that? How is that happening? And so in the science world, when we make observation, we just observe the facts. We try and keep emotions um, um, out of our observations. So once we make observations, once we can measure these observations, um, and we collect facts, and uh, really what probably one of the most important questions to ask in science is what I like to say is the why question. How many are why people out there? 
Are you a white person? Or when someone tells you something, you just say, okay. For example, if you saw a um, purple cow with green spots up on the top of the hill, would you just say, okay? Or would you say, gee, why is that cow that way? And what happens uh, um, uh, when we looked at um, Newton and the apple fell off the tree, what did Newton say? Why? Why did that apple fall off the tree? And so to begin the scientific method, we make observations. And again, we can measure um, and um, you know, scale things and so forth. So we collect facts asking the why question. Once we uh, make the observation, then the next logical step would be to say, gee, how does this work? And let's formulate what is known as a hypothesis or what I like to call a prediction. And so a prediction or a hypothesis explains or is your explanation based on your observable facts, um, how the process works or how something works. And a lot of folks will use the term educated guess, <clears throat> educated guess to uh, look at a hypothesis. So now you, you, you formulate a prediction uh, based on your uh, observations and in order to prove or disprove your hypothesis, what would be the next logical step? Well, the next logical step would be testing the hypothesis or experimenting. And so in this case, uh, one may uh, design a type of experiment um, that emulates the conditions um, of your observable facts. And uh, you would then experiment and you would test and you would test your hypothesis to see um, if in fact um, it works. And the question is, what happens if the hypothesis does not work? What happens if your testing shows you that your hypothesis, your prediction uh, is invalid or incorrect and doesn't uh, explain the, uh, you know, the, uh, the observation? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, if you think about it, it's actually a good thing because if, it's a, if, it, if it fails, then the next step would be to say, well, I'm going to make another hypothesis. I'm going to make another prediction. And then you would test that prediction. And what if that failed? That's okay, because now you're gonna make another prediction. And the more predictions you make and the more failures you make, logically, you're getting closer and closer to what the real, um, real truth is. And so one of the examples that we like to bring up in class is um, why is the sky blue? You ever thought about that? You ever looked outside, went outside, looked up at the sky and thought and asked why it was blue? Maybe some folks will just accept it. But um, if you were going to formulate a prediction or a hypothesis based on why the sky is blue, one of the most common predictions is the fact that maybe it's a reflection uh, from the ocean. Because as we said earlier, the ocean you know, represents 70% of the surface area of the earth. And so that reflection from all that water could create the, a blue sky. So based on that prediction of that hypothesis, one may set up an experiment um, to test the hypothesis and put the right amount of water, um, land masses put to sunlight, and lo and behold, it doesn't show that the sky is blue. And again, that's a good thing because now we can make another prediction. Well, it turns out that over time and using the scientific method, the sky really is blue is because it's the way our atmosphere um, absorbs the radiation coming in from the sun. And so it absorbs all the radiation and then um, leaves the blue uh, light that we see. And so based on the scientific method then, and that process of elimination um, through um, observation, hypothesis, and uh, experimentation, uh, one now has uh, determined uh, the accuracy or the truth, in this case, the atmosphere. <coughs> Pardon me. So um, at some point in the uh, scientific method, one may um, uh, come to a situation where the hypothesis now or the prediction agrees um, uh, with the testing. 
and it, it agrees over and over and doesn't change. And so in that case, we can move into what we call a scientific theory. And the scientific theory represents a well-tested hypothesis, which is a widely accepted view that explains observable facts. And the scientific theory then is brought to a science symposium, papers are written, and folks all agree, and um, now it becomes a theory. And so again, it's a well-tested hypothesis. Now, can a theory be changed? Absolutely, because more and more technology advances that take place in our society allows theories to be modified, allows theories to be changed. Uh, one example I can think of offhand is with in the last uh, 20 years, uh, our society has gotten better and better with technology by looking at things from a, a molecular level or a DNA level, for example. And being able to look at uh, uh, Earth's material from a molecular standpoint now allows uh, different theories that have been out there for a long time to be a little bit uh, uh, modified and tweaked. But how is that different than what we call a scientific law or principle? And a scientific law or principle really represents where natural processes are observed to happen in the same way. There's no deviations um, and uh, there's no deviations have ever uh, been observed. And usually in a scientific law, uh, you can use mathematical equations to explain that that uh, observed phenomena will happen the same way every time. And one of the examples I can think with respect to a scientific law uh, would be the law of gravity. And we know that if you throw something up, it always will come down. And that's because it's under the influence of the law of gravity. And in fact, the law of gravity can be explained using mathematics. If you've uh, had some physics courses um, in your past, you would find that uh, really the gravity is an acceleration force in which objects are all accelerating towards the center of the earth at about 9.8 meters per second squared. And so that's um, something that can't be changed. And that's due to the fact of the size of the earth and so forth. So a principle or a scientific law then is something that happens the same way over and over. Contrast that with scientific theory it's just a well-tested hypothesis that can be modified um, and changed um, as, for example, technology gets better. So what you should be familiar with then, uh, exam purposes, is the, uh, you should be familiar with the, uh, what the scientific method is used for. Again, it's used for uh, seeking the accuracy of, of, of the truth behind the processes uh, that take place in science and on the earth. And it's a set of logical steps through observation, through uh, predictions, hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, and then um, coming to a point where the uh, hypothesis agrees with the experimentation, you can move into scientific theory, and certainly if it can uh, observe to happen the same way every time and described by math, it can be moved into a scientific law or principle. This next slide I'm showing you is for the folks that like to learn through pictures. I'm one of those folks. And so this is basically a flow diagram that uh, shows um, the process of the scientific method. And what you can see here then is we start with, uh, let me just go back here. We start with um, uh, observations and then through observations, we make a hypothesis or predictions, we test um, that uh, prediction. If it's not consistent, then you're going to modify the hypothesis and you'll go through the same process again with testing. And again, by failing is a good thing because the more times you fail, uh, the, the closer you come to the um, accuracy or the truth of what's behind your process. So in a lot of different uh, scientific processes, um, scientists are, are well, I use the word stuck, in the uh, hypothesis and testing phase in this circle of loop here. But at some point, uh, one may um, get consistent with their experiment and hypothesis. And then of course you can uh, move into a theory. So really, um, if you look up in the upper uh, left-hand corner of the slide, you see where it says scientific method. And that really means if you fail, try, try again. 
how many have heard that saying before? And that really kind of uh, summarizes what the scientific method represents. So now I would encourage you to go back to your uh, paper in which you wrote down uh, your situation in which you tried something and you tried it, but you failed, you tried it again, you failed, but you figured out finally how to do it the correct way. And what I would challenge you to do or encourage you to do is to see in your situation, if you can fit in the terms of the scientific method, look at your passage that you wrote and see where you observed. Look at the passage that you wrote and see where you made predictions and hypotheses and where you experimented between the hypotheses and, and, uh, and uh, observations. And then look at to see where you finally figured it out and created a theory, meaning that when you are in this situation again, you'll do it again, but you'll do it uh, with respect to using the theory and you'll get it right. And I would challenge you and venture to say that uh, every day in your life, you use the scientific method. Because again, if you fail, you try again. If you fail, you try again and you finally get it right. And that really outlines uh, the scientific method. So this little next example I have in here is the scientific method in action. And we're gonna use a little astronomy example to kind of show the scientific uh, method in action. And uh, again, as we get into the latter part of the semester, uh, we'll dive into this a little bit more deeper. So this is just a little summary of looking at uh, our solar system with respect to how we know the solar system today. Because really about uh, uh, 19, 1800 years ago, um, folks did not believe the fact that the uh, sun is in the center of our solar system, but in fact, uh, they uh, believe that the Earth was in, in the middle of our solar system. So we're going to kind of follow this timeline of how the solar system evolved with respect to knowledge. And uh, what I would like to do is as we follow this uh, example, see if we can fit in different steps of the scientific method. So let's start with uh, Claudemy Ptolemy, Claudemus Ptolemy, and uh, back in uh, 90. Uh, A.D., uh, he produced what we call an algamist in which he made observations uh, on the Earth's surface and determined, based on his observations, he determined that um, we have what we call a geocentric model of, of, of our solar system. Geo mean Earth-centered. And think about this. What tools or what measurements did uh, Ptolemy have at his disposal back in 90 AD. Basically, it was just observation. And it was you walk outside and you notice the sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west. And it really, even today, uh, gives you an idea that the Earth is motionless. It doesn't move. And so based on Ptolemy's observations, it would appear that the Earth is in the center uh, of the universe in this case and all other celestial bodies uh, move around move around the Earth. And so this concept of the geocentric model went on for about 1,400 years. Think about that. The geocentric model was believed Earth in the center for 1,400 years. Now along comes this person named Nicholas Copernicus. And if you look at the date down here, the lower part of your screen, it shows you the date is about 1473 to 1543. So again, in the 1400s. And <clears throat> Nicholas Copernicus decided to make more observations based on what was available to him. And he found that his predictions for planets appearing in the nighttime sky did not co uh, coincide with the geocentric model. And so Copernicus says, wow, in order for my predictions to work, I'm going to have to modify uh, Ptolemy's geocentric. And I'm actually going to put the sun in the center and the Earth will just become a normal planet. And so this is known as the heliocentric model. And you can imagine after 1400 years of the geocentric model, this guy Copernicus comes out 
and says, no, it's a heliocentric, sun is in the center. How well do you think that went over in society? Not very well. Now, the next guy that comes along is uh, Johannes Kepler. And I want you to notice the dates at the bottom of your screen. So here you have Copernicus in the 1400s. And really in a short amount of time, Johannes Kepler comes on the scene and he is known uh, as the modern astronomer. And he developed the three planetary laws of motion. And you notice he now is in the 1500s. So it's a very short amount of time span between the heliocentric and the three laws of planetary motion. And so again, when we get to the astronomy section of the course, we'll, we'll um, talk in detail of what these uh, three planetary laws of motion represent. But the point is that under the scientific method, under those logical steps, the scientific method, knowledge is typically gained at faster and faster and faster. And so here now, uh, we're by Kepler's time, the heliocentric model was um, widely developed and um, folks uh, were uh, buying in to the heliocentric model. And then this guy comes along, the next guy comes along and this is Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton describes the three laws of motion, not planetary motion, but the three laws of motion introducing uh, the influence of gravity. Because Johannes Kepler understood um, and was able to predict where the planets would be using his three laws of motion, but he didn't know why. So along comes Isaac Newton, and Isaac Newton then um, is able to use gravity as a huge force in describing why the planets um, uh, behave the way the planets do. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, at least you can see 1600s or 1643. Um, again, it's only 100 years um, basically after Kepler. The point is that if you look at the timeline of knowledge being gained with respect to the uh, um, evolution of our solar system, you see that knowledge is gained quicker and quicker and quicker. And again, uh, this is very typical of the scientific method, because really what the scientific method represents is folks using the knowledge of previous folks. And I always like to say standing on the shoulders of knowledge. And as the knowledge is gained from one person to the next person, um, knowledge is uh, being used and advances are quicker and quicker. Another example um, that I have um, is I was, uh, you know, uh, grew up in the 1970s and uh, my grandfather um, uh, uh, used to love radios in the 1970s, old radios and, and uh, restoring them and so forth. But I remember uh, one evening in the 1970s, uh, I was about 16 or seven, probably 16, 15 or 16. And uh, we were sitting out in front of our home and my grandfather was sitting inside the car. He had this huge walkie talkie. I mean, the thing must have been, um, you know, 10 inches big. And uh, he dialed our home phone number and he called my mother in the house. And so he used this walkie talkie to make a phone call on a landline. And I remember uh, my mom answering the phone and my grandfather saying, can you hear me? And they were so excited that this walkie talkie can, uh, can now you know, call a, a, an actual phone or landline. So think about that, that was in the 1970s. So what was my grandfather uh, starting to use? Well, today that would be our cell phone. And so within from the 1970s until now, look how much advance has taken place between uh, that time period and today and developing this technology with the cell phone. Do you think that's part of the scientific method? Absolutely. Or I also predict that um, you folks at one point on uh, the next um, 20 years uh, will be able to uh, buy a uh, commercial airline ticket and fly into space. I believe that at some point in your lifetime, you're gonna be able to, to look at your earth from space. And I won't be able to do that because I will be too old. So please think of me when you're looking out that uh, window of the airplane and looking at earth from space. Is that due to the scientific method? Absolutely. Or it's certainly been predicted by 2030 that we're gonna be putting a human on Mars. 
So again, you can kind of see the scientific method uh, in, in action and, um, and how knowledge is developed uh, through those logical steps.